Okay, welcome to CRC study sessions. I was asked to come in by ULR because I use these um, materials for my counselors at Arkansas Rehab Services to help them prepare for the CRC exam. And so what I have done here is basically a condensed version of the study guide. I've taken some major points from the study guide and presented them in a presentation format to you. So I would still suggest that you read through the study guide or study manual, whatever you're using to study for a more in-depth look into the CRC items to be able to properly prepare for the exam. Just some opening tips before we begin. Make sure that you test yourself regularly um, when you're studying for the CRC exam, and I'll go through this again at the end of our session, because you want to see where you're at as you're studying along. So just to go through and study constantly and not test yourself to see where your strengths and weaknesses are would not be beneficial to you. It could only help you to every few weeks test yourself. And then some things you may can slack off on and you may need to focus more on maybe some counseling theories. That's usually an area where students or counselors really need some more in-depth look. So try to do that um, and test yourself regularly. I've provided uh, Ms. McKissick with some materials, but you can also come up with your own uh, test questions or exam or whatever format you would like to use to test yourself or quiz yourself just to see where you at because again coming into a counseling field especially we have counseling you understand the importance of an assessment so you need to assess yourself from time to time I would also say in my study sessions that I have face to face I like to do towards the end of the training where I set up um, a site where it would actually be like if you were to go to an exam site. That will help ease some of the anxiety. So familiarize yourself with the exam site, know where the location is, know what is required when you get there, and that will help ease a lot of the anxiety because, again, a lot of the reasons that many students or counselors don't pass the exam. It's not because they don't know the material or they haven't studied. It's because they let that anxiety overwhelm them when taking the exam. And just know that you can do this. Okay, we're going to start with some background. And I know that his historical facts usually aren't the most fun thing to know or to study over, but we have to know our history so that we can move forward. So you do need to know some acts or things that help shape vocational rehabilitation. So I wrote down a few of the acts that usually most individuals refer to and that you may find on the exam. So it would be, it'd behoove you to know most of these dates pretty well. 1908, of course, that's the Federal Employees Workers Comp Act, and this was an act that was an alternative to suing work-related injuries, excuse me, the 1914 War Risk Act. This act provided rehabilitation and vocational training. So you can kind of see this as the start of it. It gave the U.S. government the authority to ensure ships at sea. So that's a very interesting fact. The 1917 Smith-Hughes Act, a lot of rehab counselors usually know about this act because it made federal monies available to states on a matching basis. It also established a federal board for vocational education. So usually that's very easy to remember because we're talking about funding. And uh, our rehab counselors are very familiar with our, our funding sources. 1918 is the Soldiers Rehab Act. That's another familiar act for individuals in this field, and it created vocational rehabilitation programs for disabled veterans. 1920, the smith Fest Act is also known as the Civilian Vocational Rehabilitation Act. It established a civilian vocational rehabilitation program. So remember, we had the 19... 18 Soldiers Rehab Act, and then right after that, because it was just doing the disabled veterans, the 1920, which is very important to know, was the Smith-Fest Act. Try saying that 20 times. 
would open it up to civilians and not just disabled veterans. 1935 Social Security Act, it uh, made vocate as part of the Social Security, vocational rehab became part of a federal program. 1936, you have the Randolph Shepard Act. This authorized blind individuals to operate vending stands on federal property. Usually that's one that is, is usually remembered as well because it's very specific um, population within in, uh, the community. The 1938 Wagner-O'Day Act, this act required the federal government to purchase certain products from workshops for the blind, thereby expanding employment opportunities in those workshops. And then lastly, we have the 1943 Barden Lafayette Act. This was an extremely important act in that it expanded eligibility for vocational rehab services to the mentally challenged and psychiatrically um, disabled individuals. It also expanded the types of physical restoration services. So this is very interesting that could be provided to individuals with disabilities. It also provided some maintenance funds, which again for the individuals that already work in the field are familiar with those maintenance funds, which are usually some types of assistance while a person is in a training program that they may need some assistance with transportation or other things like that. But transportation can be a separate funding source, but then it can also uh, fall under maintenance if it's something that's needed for them to continue on with their training. And both require the establishment of a, of a financial need. So now we're going to go into hopefully an area that everyone is familiar with in talking with talking about the Vocational Act amendments. And we'll start here with the 1954 uh, amendment. Public Law 565 represented a major expansion of the federal government's involvement with voc rehab. It increased the federal share of funding from the 50-50 to three federal dollars for every two state dollars. And it expanded annual federal funding to 65 million by 1958. Also services in mental health were greatly expanded. It also authorized research and demonstration grants. So 1954 was the start of many great things to come on the vocational rehab. In 1965, we had some more expansions on the Vocational Act, and it expanded the state funding ratio to 75-25, which is great. It provided for six to 18 months in extended evaluation to determine if the more severely uh, individuals with disabilities might benefit from vocational services. So we're moving on to 1973. This act kind of redirected vocational rehab in a way that it was making its first priority was to serve the most severe individuals with disabilities. The behavior disorder category was discontinued during this time and also consumer involvement was stressed more, requiring them to do what we now call the IPE, which is the Individualized Plan for Employment, but at that time it was called the Individualized Written Rehabilitation Program Plan. And it's just basically what the IP started, it was the beginnings of what the IP is today, and basically just the start of a contract to make sure that the consumer knew what was involved in their, in their rehab program and that they approved of it, and so they had to sign it. Now under Title V of, an, of the Rehab Act of 1973, we'll just talk about a few things in here. Talk about Section 501, which required non-discrimination in hiring. We're all very familiar with that. 502 established the Architectural and Transportation Barriers and Compliance Board to oversee the compliance to the Architectural Barrier Acts of 1968. 503 prohibited discrimination against individuals with disabilities in employment by any federal contractor or subcontractor receiving $2,500 or more. And then 504 pro prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in a supported, federally supported program or activity. 
It also applied to organizations that were receiving federal funds. Now, the Rehab Act amendments of 1974, 1976, and 1978 were just, these amendments just further strengthened the emphasis on services to individuals with the most severe disabilities. The Rehab Act of 19, amendments, Act amendments of 1986, the major feature of this act was that it authorized state rehab agencies to provide supported employment uh, services to individuals with severe disabilities. The Rehab Act amendments of 1992 uh, provided some legislation that strongly emphasized consumer involvement in the policies and procedures of state rehab agencies and in the development, again, what is now called their IPE. At that time, it was called the IWRP. It also mandated that states uh, have what we call state rehab councils. Work Investment Act and Rehab Acts of 1998. Let me see how I can shorten it. It combines some rehab, uh, rehabilitation legislation uh, with other federally supported job training programs and block grants. You'll hear about the DHS block grants when you uh, start doing some field work in rehab agencies if you have not already. And this purpose was to kind of provide a one-stop type of delivery of services for individuals who needed to secure some employment and to facilitate the sharing of employment resources. Now, some of the provisions of ADA, let's talk about Title I for a minute, that again falls on employment. Very uh, similar along the lines of when we go back to Title V and talk about those sections. Title I under the ADA is employment, and it prohibits employment discrimination against individuals with disabilities in the public sector and government at all levels. Title II is public services and it says no qualified individual with a disability may be excluded by reason of disability from participation in or deny the benefit of services activities or program of a public entity title three is public accommodation and this title prohibits discrimination based on disability in goods services facilities privileges or advantages uh, in any places of public accommodation. And then Title IV mm -hmm. is telecommunication, and this requires telephone relay services to operate 24 hours a day for individuals with hearing impairments or speech mm -hmm. impairments. And then Title V is just miscellaneous provisions. This section states that no individual can be discriminated against because of their role in an ADA complaint or investigation. All right, going on to our next section here. And that is actually the end of the first CRC study session. And we have six of these sessions, and so I'll just go on to number two.